You ever have a hook break? You ever have a hook bend? You ever have a hook pull out of a fish's mouth? I have. <laughs> this podcast episode is for you. <laughs> Today we're talking about hooks and the importance of hooks. But before we start, if you are wondering who the amazing voices are behind the Level Up Fishing podcast, I am Stormy Cochran. And I'm Andy Cochran. And we are the owners of GSO Fishing, where we live, eat, and breathe fish. <laughs> we started a guide service over 17 years ago on Blue Mesa Reservoir and have been fishing all over the country for multi-species of fish for the last two decades. And we started our own lure business several years ago and hooks was the biggest driver for our motivation for our lure design so we really want to dive into it let's be clear hooks was andy's baby he was the one who did all the research put all the thought into it every hook that we picked for our products he picked yeah we went through all the brands you've all heard of them mustad owner eagle claw laser sharp trocar Gamakatsu, Victory, VMC, etc., etc., etc. There are piles of hooks on the market. Um, some do a really good job. Some others just do a job. And some others make our job much harder. Yep. So we spend a lot of time sifting through the market. And we feel like we've got our jig heads dialed in for... The style of fishing that each head is suited to do. So we are going to break down hooks today. And there's a lot to cover, so let's let's get to it. We have already discussed um, line ties and 60s versus 90. All of our jig heads are either on a 60 or a 90. Um, so we already broke that down in a previous episode, so go back, watch... No, I guess you would listen to it. <laughs> Don't, I mean, you can watch it if you want to, but listen to that episode. Um, you can find it on YouTube or Facebook. But from there, we are going to talk about wire gauge. Yeah, so if you look at a, a blank hook, um, the first thing you see is where the line tie goes. As Stormy mentioned, we've covered that pretty in depth. Um, but the next piece to the hook is how thick the hook is. So we refer to that as wire gauge. And on the market, it's fairly standard for wire gauge to be described as light wire. And then you, from light wire, it, it gets a little tricky in how they mention the strength of the hook versus the thickness of the wire of the hook. There's not really a medium gauge wire reference. From there, it kind of goes 1x, 2x, 3x, heavy, extra heavy, salt heavy, etc. So what all that means is like a 1x is like a standard gauge hook. So you might call that a medium gauge. If you're looking at, you know, a light wire versus a heavy wire, there's got to be something in the middle. So the They'll call them like 1x strong, which is standard, 2x strong, 3x strong. So you can get kind of bored with all those numbers, but <laughs> that's what that means. Um, so that kind of is a real basic wire gauge breakdown. Are you looking for something light, medium, heavy, extra heavy? So what all that tells you is the lighter the hook, the easier it's going to be to penetrate because there's not the physical diameter of wire to penetrate into a fish's mouth. But the lighter the wire, the easier it is to bend. So there's got to be a compromise in there somewhere. So with that being said, you've got to look at the gauge of the wire on your hook that you want to use for your conditions. So different species or different conditions call for a different strength of a hook. If I'm fishing for, you know, trout or panfish or something in an open water environment, I want a real light wire hook that penetrates easy. But if I'm flipping heavy cover for bass, 
you know, I might be catching two or three pound bass, so I don't need like a super burly hook just for the fish by itself. But if I'm pulling 15 pounds of hydrilla out with the bass, I've got to use a very heavy wire hook to get all of that stuff extracted from the lake without the hook just bending straight. So how do you know which one to use? Like, do you just keep multiple on your boat? What do you do? So I typically will start with the lightest wire hook that I feel like I can get away with because hook penetration probably outweighs hook strength okay. to a point. So obviously if you get into a certain situation and that hook you're using, you start to see it bend out and start to flex out, then obviously you want to get something a little heavier. But start out with the lightest wire hook because it's going to at least let you hook the fish and then you can kind of adjust from there. Well, that's a good point. What is hook flex? So we talk about how, a, how the point might flex or start to bend away from the line tie or open up is how you would kind of rate the flex of a hook. And so, you know, for a long, long time, most hooks were what was considered a round bend hook. So as we talk about the hooks from top to bottom, that kind of brings us to the next part of the hook anatomy, and that is the bend of the hook. So there's, there's really two major hook bends as far as at least single hooks on the market. There's a round bend, and then there's a style called a sickle style, which different manufacturers are call their sickle style something different. Like trocars are called a Pro V bend. And like VMC has a barbarian bend. Um, Matt Zuo came out with a sickle hook a, decades ago. They were the first ones that came out with a sickle style hook. And so... That was kind of a design that's been adapted by pretty much all the major manufacturers. And the big reason for that bend style is it, it has an acute sharp angles when it comes, it goes straight and then it, it's real sharp up, sharp back, and then sharp down rather than just a sweeping round bend. And so what happens to that style of a hook is it resists flex way better. Okay. And then you've, but you've also got to be very careful about the steel involved with those hooks. Certain hooks, when they're built, are tempered or finished in a way that makes them very brittle. So that's been another characteristic that we've really sorted through in a lot of the hooks on the market was we want to test the point sharpness, obviously, but we also want to check the flex and we also want to check the brittleness of the hook. And so we've sorted off a lot of the hooks on the market because one, either we didn't like the point sharpness or, or two, a major one for us is hooks that break. Mm -hmm. So a hook that bends isn't the end of the world. When it breaks, you're it's just as bad as breaking your line. You lose the fish when your hook breaks. So we don't tolerate breaking hooks at all. So You don't even think about that when you're out fishing. You think a hook's a hook. It's metal. It's not going to break. But they definitely break. <laughs> yeah. They, they get twisted and bent and reformed and bent and reformed. And eventually they break. And so <clears throat> that's one thing also... If you buy a brand new jig, take it out of the package, grab it with a pair of pliers and start reefing on it back and forth and see if it'll hold up. Because that's a really important characteristic in any hook. Is, is it Can it bend and get bent back to shape and be okay? Or is it just going to break? That's something you need to look at. Now, when we say that, we don't mean grab it by the point. Right. <laughs> don't grab it by the point. <laughs> grab it by the hook shank. <laughs> So that brings us to overall length and hook gap. So you'll see as you're looking at sizes of hooks on the market that it's relatively standardized. So there's, you know, something like a size 10 hook and there's a size 1 hook and there's a size 5 aught hook, like 5 slash 0. 
as you go up in numbers, the hook actually gets smaller. <laughs> so a size 1 is much bigger than a size 10. When you get into the aught sizes, a 1 aught is much smaller than a 5 aught. So that's how the sizing is supposed to work. And what this tells you is is one real important thing is the overall length of the hook and also the hook gap, which we'll get into in a minute. But you want to match up the length of the hook for the lure or jig or body or whatever you're trying to use with the hook. So if you have a paddle-tailed swim bait that's four inches long and you want the bend of the hook to come out about a third of the way back on the swim bait's body, most of the time you would want a three-aught hook on that. And so those are the sorts of things that you have to look at, but it'll help you pick the right size. You put a three-aught hook in that swim bait and you're like, man, that looks way too big. I better go down to a one-aught or something like that. And as somebody who makes these jigs, this stuff is still somewhat Greek to me. Like, looking at the sizing numbers, I, I don't always get it. So, if you are like me, you can always ask somebody. Just ask somebody in the sporting goods or wherever you may be, and they can help you out with that kind of stuff too. On our website, we have it listed, like on our tubes, uh, or tube jig heads, it'll say this fits a four inch, five inch tube, whatever it may be. So you know that's what it best fits. So yeah, the, it, it is kind of confusing. And it <laughs> if you have the like the plastic and the jig head together, then you can kind of match them up visually. But if you're just grabbing jig heads for the stuff you have at home, it sometimes it's helpful to ask or you know, take some measurements or something even. Because yeah. the the fit of the hook makes a lot of difference in how the bait presents properly too. So it's something you need to be aware of. Um, probably the easiest one on the market to just, like, that's real standard is treble hooks. Like a size 5 treble hook is pretty much the same regardless of manufacturer. The other thing you'll see on treble hooks is... They make short shank treble hooks and they make like, again, like the 2X strong, 3X strong. And what that's telling you is the length from the line tie down to the bend is the shaft length. So if it's like short, regular, or 2X long or something, that's what that means. And again, the like 2X strong, 3X strong, that's telling you what the wire gauge is on a treble hook also. So if you need really burly treble hooks, you know, like a 3X strong is like the heaviest wire that you'll find on a treble hook. Yeah. Jig hooks are not quite as standard. We've definitely found that <laughs> out. Um, our heavy wire tubes are on a 5 aught trocar heavy wire hook. And... A 5 aught Gamakatsu heavy wire hook is absolutely not the same size. Nope. Um, so that's just more on our end trying to get sizing right. But that's just something to be aware of too. So Yeah, it is. they are not the same across the board. And then, you know, just to make it more confusing, they'll, they all make like a, a 1 aught long and a 1 aught extra long. <laughs> and so then it's so a lot of times the size of the hook also, like I said, said before, has a lot to do with the hook gap. Yeah. And so what the hook gap means is that's the measured distance between the point of the hook straight down to the shaft of the hook. So the wider that gap is typically relates to the size of the hook. So if you go to a size 10, it's going to be a very narrow space. Even if it's a size 10 extra long the hook gap is still the same. It's just the shaft of the wire that's longer. So we have, let's talk about that. We have um, our super shorts, 60s, and then our, um, why am I drawing a blank? We have, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, a tube jig head that we designed for 
like bitsy tubes or real small fat tubes like two to three inch little tubes and we originally came out with one called the short shank tube jig thank you which is on a <laughs> two watt gamakatsu hook and then trocar released a new hook last year that we jumped all over and it's actually a one aught and if you look at the two hooks side by side, the physical length and the wire gauge are almost identical, but the Gamakatsu has a notably wider hook gap. Now, why would we want to have two? Because, again, I can't even say the names because we should have named one like Betsy and one Sue or something. Right. But why, if they're the same length, same, why do we have two? So that kind of brings the point to where hook gap matters. And... A lot of bass anglers and salt anglers like really big hook gaps because a lot of their fish have really big mouths. <laughs> and a bigger hook gap usually equates to better hook ups because there's more distance between the point and the shank. So there's more space there for the point to connect into the tissue of a fish and the hook up ratio is typically better. Yeah. But on the trout side of things and perch, panfish kind of market, maybe not crappie, but like perch, walleye, trout, these fish have really slender, small mouths. You know, if you look at the mouth of a three pound rainbow trout and compare it to the mouth of a three pound largemouth, <laughs> yeah. huge difference. Very big difference. So a lot of what we do is scaled down to physically fit in a trout's mouth easily yeah. to where you can still get them to react and eat your bait and you can still hook them so yeah. the reason we came out with the super short tube jig hook was because we have such a huge market here for trout and using those small tube jigs is a very effective way to catch them but our regular short tube jig head has such a bigger hook gap that oftentimes you won't catch as many trout with it because of it. Yeah. It almost hinders it a little bit. No. Not that you can't, but it's it's a little bit of a disadvantage. And then on the hook gap thing, okay, let's talk about this because I think pairing soft plastics is a big deal too. We were fishing last fall on the flats and I had this jig and I lost it and I didn't have any more of the same color. So I tried to pair these two together that were not designed to be together and the hook gap was awful. And so every time I was fishing, I was hooking them and I, they couldn't stay on. And Carly thought it was great because we were having a fishing competition. And so she loved that I couldn't land one. But it you pointed out specifically that the hook gap was wrong because the bait was too big for the head. Despite the fact that clearly it was the right color. But I could never hook them because basically the hook was overpowered by the soft plastic. So that's an important factor with hook gap as well. It's not putting too much of a tube or a tail or whatever you want to call it on yeah that's a really good example of having exactly the right that was a swim bait in that mm -hmm. case exactly the right color size profile everything was right about the swim bait but the hook was wrong yep and so that's such an important thing to always keep in mind it's like I'm getting tons of bites, I'm getting tons of hits, but I'm not hooking up, I'm not hooking up, these things keep falling off. It's probably your hook. Yeah. And so, in that case, we just needed to get, I think we used a one size bigger hook, and mm -hmm. it made all the difference in the world. And it was like, you know, 19 out of 20 were hooked. <laughs> yeah. and, it was, and it was literally just going up one size on the hook. Yeah. Carly was not impressed with that when you fixed it for me. <laughs> Okay, before we get to hook points, we asked on our Facebook page um, this week if anyone, we, we mentioned that we were going to do this podcast episode about hooks, and we asked if anyone had any questions about hooks. And Christopher had a great 
question. And he says, some say red hooks trigger more strikes. Is it really worth it to change out the brown slash black slash silver hooks on lures and jigs for red hooks? What's your opinion on that? Very good question. We get asked about that a lot as well. Um, so a couple things about hook colors. They're typically... Freshwater hooks are typically black or bronze. And then saltwater hooks are typically like, they're almost like a galvanized steel silver color. Hmm. So a lot of times you can just differentiate the quality of the finish just by looking at the color. So there's one more, there's another thing to warn you about colored hooks is um, some are uh, like a, dipped on finish and some are a baked in finish and so even the color of the hook can be a quality issue so if you want to use red hooks get some pretty much the only red hooks on the market that hold up are gamakatsus yeah. like they bake their red into their finish that they put on their hooks and so that hook stays red forever cheap hooks the red starts blowing off and then you have like a camo hook <laughs> but as far as selecting hook color uh, my own personal preference on this and like you say a lot of people say it helps and a lot of people say it doesn't matter um i think the biggest change in hooks that i've seen that i've probably heard the most advantage of is on jerk baits changing out the front hook to a red treble hook because in theory it gives those visual predators a strike point and on a jerk bait you want those fish to be eating it head first so you hook more fish when they get the bait sideways in their mouth rather than nipping at the tail generally speaking however if you have the right cadence and color of a jerk bait they just eat it so for me personally, I've we've certainly tried the red hook thing off and on for a lot of different jig heads, treble hooks on our hard baits, etc. And I personally feel like if you've got the right presentation in your selection of lures to start with, the hook color doesn't matter. That's what I think personally. Yeah. And the great thing about fishing is it's like a science experiment. Try it. If it works for you, definitely do it. Get good hooks, like yeah. Andy said. But if it works for you, great. If not, that's okay. You learn some. Yes, it's certainly worth the experiment. Yeah. It's like we can, we use corn for lures on our lures when we're trolling. And it's like, you know what? Like, maybe we're catching more fish with it. Maybe we're not. But it doesn't hurt to try. Yeah. And it might, on certain days, that might just be the last thing that makes you catch way more fish. So don't just take my word for it. Like, try it. I like it. But <laughs> get good ones. Yeah. <laughs> Quality hooks matter. They yeah, make yeah. a huge difference. Like 90% of our hard baits, the first thing we do is change the hooks out. Yeah. Like stock treble hooks are bad <laughs> for the most part. Um so that's one thing we do anyways. And so I think it's it's worth mentioning that um, I, I'll just say I'm a hook snob. And <laughs> through guiding for so long, I have seen how much difference a hook can make. A huge difference in how many fish you land and how many fish you lose. Yep. I firmly believe that a hook is the number one thing that will cost you fish. I, yeah, I agree. We are, we are kind of snip, uh, hook snobs. <laughs> you, you definitely are. So speaking of that, I mean, that's, this is where, again, our entire lineup of jigs came from. Yep. We were guiding fishing. And as you know, we are on a huge trout market and lake trout are a big part of that. And if you're fishing for one or two bites a day to catch the fish of a lifetime and you have a hook fail... You're not going to let that happen very more before you, you fix it. Yeah. And so that's what we aimed to do with what we're doing. 
is we want you to hook and land the fish of a lifetime. And we feel like that's that's really the basis for what we're doing on our at least our jig lineup is we want you to be the most successful. So again, we just like reiterate it over and over and over. It's like hooks matter. Well, and let's okay. Let's talk about that. We are not here to badmouth any company or anything, but there are definitely companies out there that have some design flaws in their big tube jig heads. And it's a bummer to see because there are some great companies out there that have these huge tube jig heads that are fitting these big Tora tubes, but they're using like light wires. Which, when you have a 70-pound lake trout fighting... If you have a 20-pound lake trout fighting you, and you're using a light wire tube jig head, that is going to malfunction. Yeah. And so it's a bummer to see that there are... So be careful. When you are buying products, really think about the fish you are targeting. Think about how they react when you hook them. Is the flex of the wire going to be a problem? Is the wire going to break? You know, like really, really sit down and look at those things. We're not saying, oh, do you have to buy ours? That's not what we're saying. We're saying when you go out and you go to purchase a tube jig head, really look at the quality of the jig head because there are outstanding companies that have very flawed tube jig heads. Yeah, and... And you can see where they're coming from with those yep. hooks because the lighter wire hooks penetrate easier yep. and a large lake trout has a very hard mouth. Yep. And so that makes sense that you'd want a light wire hook just so you can hook the fish. But like say before, you kind of got to know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to get a hook into a fish like that, but getting it landed is a whole different ball game. Yeah. Uh, like Stormy said, a 20-pound lake trout will wreck your tackle. <laughs> yes. They fight like all get out. And so there's a fine line there between having a heavy enough wire where it'll stand up to all that force and a point strong enough and sharp enough to stick one and hold it. Well, that leads us to... Jesse didn't have so much a question, but Jesse commented on that post about hook sets about hooks and he mentioned about hook sets um so let's talk about points and hook sets so what jesse mentioned was an old guide of ours who's still a very good friend of ours <laughs> yeah. told jesse that if he didn't have holes in his ice fishing shack from him swinging the rod so hard it was putting a hole in the roof of his ice fishing shack <laughs> that he wasn't setting the hook hard enough i love it so that is, that's really where this whole thing started years ago is, okay, a lake trout is a, an enormous predator. Yeah. And they have the lightest bite of any, <laughs> almost any fish we fish yes. for. That's Sometimes you think detecting a perch bite's hard. Try to detect a 40 pound lake trout bite. Yeah. That sounds crazy, but they don't give you much. No, it's nuts. So you got to have a hair trigger. And the other part of that is you got to be able to hit them hard and fast. And that is a, that's a huge problem. Yeah. For people that don't get to experience that very often, it is nearly impossible to pick up on. Or if you're fishing, if you're used to fishing for a fish that you need to wait and give time to put that jig in their mouth then you're already predisposed to not set the hook right away, you know? And so, and then suddenly you're fishing for a lake trout and they're like, swing! Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's unnatural. I am not somebody who sets the hook well. I never have. And I fished for a very, very long time. And setting the hook is still, to this day, one of my biggest problems. Yep. So... That leads us to why we use trocar hooks in a majority of the stuff that we make. Yep. So they're, they have hook penetration charts all over the place, kind of, you know, third-party people checking penetration rates of different hooks. And a trocar hook point 
penetrates 50% easier than the next closest hook. So what that means is all you have to do is just pull on it mm -hmm. and it right away it starts cutting a hole. Now what it when you start looking at points on hooks, there's a ton of different styles and manufacturing techniques to get the point on the hook. And so that's literally the business end of the hook. Yeah. And so this is where we went through just tons of different ones. One was, you know, we checked a lot of hooks for how brittle they are and all that. And then the next most important thing is the point. We want, you know, over the years guiding and just fun fishing and fishing with Stormy, who doesn't <laughs> like to set the hook. Yep. And kids, and let's kids, be honest. Absolutely. They don't they don't set the hook, you know. And really any anybody jig fishing that that is a hard bite to detect. Yep. You're like, is that a rock? Is that a <laughs> stick? Is that a fish? What am <laughs> I bottom? what is it? So we always say hook sets are free, but when you swing and miss on eight or ten sticks in a row, then you start getting kind of gun shy. Yep. And you don't want to just like hammer back a hook set all the time. So we needed to come up with the point on our hooks that would make it the easiest for somebody to hook a fish with. And so we pretty much got it narrowed down to there's the trocar point, which is actually, it's the same manufacturing process that they use to finish scalpels in surgery. That's insane. So, and it's cut that way on three sides of the point. So it literally is almost the same thing as a broadhead yeah. for archery hunting. So when that point hits, it has three contact points that are like sharper than razor blades that literally cut into bone. After that, you've got the barb of the hook, which is something else we'll mention here in a minute. I can attest to that. I dropped a trocar the other day. It slid down my shin, huh? And not only did it slice me open, it got hooked in my shin just because it was going down my leg because I dropped it. It's they, and the crazy thing is you don't feel it until later because it's so sharp. They are scalpel sharp cutting points. Yep. And so for what we use trocar hooks for, we feel like that's the right point for that technique. Yeah. Because the way that thing is designed, all you have to do is just pull pressure on it and it just cuts and cuts and cuts until it gets to the barb and then right. and then it's hooked. Yep. Now on the other side of it, there's the other hook that we really like that we use a lot of is a gamakatsu. Their points are chemically sharpened and so it's way over my head technical, but that's what's considered a needle point. Eagle Claw makes, most companies make needle point hooks. Yeah. Eagle Claw makes their laser sharp, which is the same needle point manufacturing process. Almost all the other ones do too. Mustad Owner, VMC, Victory, etc., etc. So... What a needle point does is it's just, it's, it's so tiny of a diameter out on the end of the point, and it basically tapers back to the full wire gauge thickness. They actually use a chemical to eat that material away to like the finest point on the end that they can get. And so that's kind of how that hook is built. The other the other style of point on the market is just a basically a ground hook, which is like a standard eagle claw hook, or you know, I think a lot of the mustad hooks are just ground hooks. And so it literally you're taking like a like basically a grinder and they just like grind a face on it and call it good. So those points, like a standard hook like that's gonna be the least sharp. The needle point is going to be the most sharp. 
and a trocar is going to be the cutting point. So <laughs> it, they are different. Yep. Uh, a lot of guys that use trocar hooks actually don't like them for certain techniques because they cut so easily and they cut so much. I think uh, one example is like, uh, like bass fishing with a really heavy weight jig because we talked about this in our jig head weight podcast. When you're using a jig head that is very, very heavy on say a fish like a bass or something that oftentimes fights with its mouth open and it gets a lot of pendulum swing with that heavy head, that trocar point can actually cut a bigger hole than you want. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times for our, our biggest heads and stuff, we use gamakatsus because that one won't keep cutting bigger holes, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a time and a place for both. Well, and like the trocar, I mean, I, I love it. I, I absolutely love the trocar hook. But another factor is making sure the fish is actually eating the lure. Sometimes you'll go trout fishing and instead of eating the lure, they sit on it or they smother it. And you go and you set the hook with the trocar hook, you're going to slice them open. You're going to slice their bellies open. You know, um, one of our guides actually had that happen with the lake trout where it didn't actually bite the hook and he felt that tick and he set the hook and it sliced the lake trout open. It was a pup and that sucks, but it happens. And so you want to make sure they're actually eating that hook rather than some, I don't, some, I don't know why they do it, but they definitely do. They sit there and sit on your tube jig rather than eat your tube jig. Yeah, like smash it in the dirt, they hit it with their tail, they do yes. weird stuff. So um, that brings us to kind of s in a long way around, <laughs> yeah. brings, us, brings us back to Jesse's comment about setting the hook. And um, with a trocar hook, you you can overset it and yeah. hurt yourself. Yep. It's so sharp. And it cuts such a good hole that if you really hammer on it, it actually will slice its way out. Yep. And so the reason we use trocar points on the hooks on the majority of our stuff is because over the years guiding and fishing for fun and being around jig fishermen that don't want to set the hook like Bill Dance, and you shouldn't need to. Yeah. We want a hook that's easy. Yeah. You feel a bite, and you just pull on it and start reeling, and you're done. And so that's there's one more part of the point that comes back, and it's called the barb. And that's one more thing that is worth visual inspection anytime you're buying a jig head for anything. Yeah. How far away from the point of the hook is the barb down the bend? The closer it is to the point, that's it's going to do two things. First, it's going to make the transition from a sharp point to the full wire gauge really fast. And so that style of a hook is going to require a hard hook set. Because you don't have this long point that kind of tapers to give you a little bit of space to let that narrow point cut or penetrate to the barb. If it's a very short space between the point and the barb, and I'm talking short, like eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch is short. Mm -hmm. You have to snap that thing hard to get it past the barb. That's the whole point with any of these hooks is like... You need the point to get past the barb in order to land the fish. Yep. So if you look at gamakatsu and trocars, that barb is a lot farther down the hook shank in comparison to a lot of other hooks on the market. And so at first you think that's bad because you think you got to pull that point a lot farther into the fish's face to be able to hook it past the barb, but in it actually is easier 
because there's so much there's such a longer gradual taper of the point all the way to the full wire gauge on that hook that it actually slides in much quicker and much cleaner and much farther and then you also have that much more point in the fish's face before the barb so it gives you a lot more leeway in being able to keep that barb in the fish the whole battle yeah that's kind of a that's one other thing that we looked at when we we're looking at all these different hooks and there's that seems so technical and weird but the next time you're sitting there looking at all your hooks be like man this i catch a lot of fish on this jig head it, it works but this one like look at the look at where the barb is how pronounced the barb is like the higher it stands up the harder it's going to be to pull through to get it hooked past the bar and that could be some of the reasons why anglers are losing fish you know if you're doing a pressure set like andy talked about with a needle point you might not be penetrating far enough into the fish's bony jaw with that you might have to do a bill dance bass master classic set you know or like with the trocar, you don't want to do that because you can cut your cut the jig back out of the fish's mouth. Yeah. And so pressure set for trocars and a harder hook set for more needle point jigs. Yeah, any needle point jig head is going to require more more of a snap to get it to set. Yeah. Where a trocar you just want to pull on it. And so that'll bring us to one kind of last thing on the points. And we had another Facebook post a couple of weeks ago where <clears throat> we were showing our heavy wire tube jig head. And if you look at that one, and if you look at our mega tube and our grave digger, the thing that you will notice that this person brought up too in that post was he was shocked that you could hook anything with that hook because the point actually points down like towards the line tie mm -hmm. on a standard round bend hook the point is actually like parallel to the shank of the hook yep on most sickle style hooks or pro v bend hooks the point actually aims down towards the line tie more and it's sometimes more of an, a sharper angle than others, but we sort of equate that to a circle hook. Mm -hmm. So a circle hook, literally the point is almost perpendicular to the shaft yeah. of the hook. And again, on a circle hook, all you have to do is you feel the bite and you just start reeling and the thing hooks itself. Yep. That's how they're designed to work. So when you look at like a Pro V Trocar or our big salty Gamakatsus or what they call a big river, which is their sickle style that we use in our standard 90s, the points on those hooks point down towards the line tie. Obviously not as extreme as a circle hook, but it's sort of the same idea. When a fish puts that thing in his mouth and you put pressure on the line it rolls the point into the perfect position and all you have to do is on a needle point you've got to snap it a little bit but on a trocar you just reel it and gamakatsu's needle point is so sharp compared to anybody else yeah. hands down sharper even with those even though it's a needle point with that style of a point actually pointing downhill it actually allows you to feel the bite and just start pulling and give it hard, hard, steady, hard pressure. And you, you have set the hook. Yep. The biggest, one of the biggest things that costs people fish is the hook set. Yep. You set it too hard, you break your line. You set it too hard, you break the hook. You set it too hard, you cut the thing out of the fish's mouth. You set it too hard, you rip it out of his mouth. <laughs> yeah. What I wanted to get away from is 
having to have that crazy reaction where you're snapping holes in the roof of your ice <laughs> hut because you think you need to set the hook so hard. I want you to feel the bite and just start pulling the fish to you. And there is, I mean, there are jigs that you need to do that, but that's what we wanted to eliminate with ours. We, because of experience on the water with clients and your wife, <laughs> <laughs> who has lost many a big lake trout in her life, before we came up with this, I lost so many big lake trout that would come in and I'd lose them because I never set the hook. I never did. And it cost me big time. So now we're able to we're able to use really fast action sensitive rods, braided line, floral carbon, get all the stretch out of your line, get all the sensitivity you can get to detect all these super crazy light bites. But now as soon as you can detect that bite, you can just start pulling on that fish. You have all the power in your setup. Where back in the day, if you were using that kind of a setup with, you know, these old school round bed needle point hooks or even like ground hooks, which were on the market or big saltwater hooks, that was like the only thing big enough on the market before you had to reef on those things or snap the heck out of them to get that point set. And you, you missed them or you broke them as often as you caught them. Yeah. Well, that brings us to a really good point. Okay. So you have all these, you use them. How long are they actually good? When do you clean them out? What do you look for when you're like, okay, I need to, I need to upgrade, or not upgrade, but replace these hooks. What, what do you personally look for when you are spring cleaning or fall cleaning your jig heads? So that's, you know, there's fine print to all of this. Mm -hmm. Like this is like high efficiency gear. Yeah. So it's a lot like, are you driving a race ready Corvette or are you driving your forerunner? <laughs> like some of these things are meant to go 500,000 miles and some of them are meant to win and there's you can't use both interchangeably and so one thing that you will notice about trocar hooks and this is one this is like one example of like uh, we said on our hard baits we replace almost all the treble hooks on our hard baits all the time and I will not use trocar treble hooks on a crankbait because those things bang through the rocks and they hit stuff all the time. So because a trocar point is, it's so fine and it's so sharp and it's so surgically sound mm -hmm. that it doesn't hold up to abrasion very well. Ah. So a lot of times if we're using stuff that we know are going to be in the rocks a lot, we stay away from that style of a point because we know it's just going to get beat up. And it is a very hard point to sharpen. Yep. Needlepoint hooks can bend at the point easier, but the overall sharpness stays better in abrasion situations and they're easier to sharpen yeah so if you run your crankbait through 100 rock piles you can typically pull a needle point hook out and straighten the point and file it and you're good okay. a trocar is probably toast so that's one example where the hook point style matters for what you're what you're doing yeah with it and like we said, we we fully believe in sharp hooks. Yeah. They make all the difference. And so if you go through your tackle box and you have dull hooks, that's when we would replace them. Yeah. And or file them or whatever you need to do. So like in a bass tournament situation, we we it's all new hooks before we have like pre-fish hooks <laughs> that are either bent over or dull. And then for the tournament, it's all new hooks. 
And during the day, every single fish you catch, you check the hooks. Yeah. Every time you hang it up on something, you check the hook. Every hour, whether anything happened to it or not, you check the hooks. Same as checking your line. Yeah. Check check your hooks. And that's if you lose two fish in a row, check your hooks. Check your hook. There's but, probably something wrong with your hook. Because if you, I mean, like even on our pill heads, if you catch three trout and then you lose three in a row that thing might be bent open because of the wire gauge and the way those fish fight and twist and twirl and alligator roll you very well could have bent it open and that could be why you're losing them so yeah light wire hooks you always want to check that they're in their original shape yeah because they get tweaked and they get bent because they're light wire hooks yeah um but Again, a good quality light wire hook can withstand all that and not just break. You can bend it back straight and go back to what you're doing. You're fine. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and then, yeah, besides that, I think, you know, it's just, especially on like a big lake trout or something, like you get one of those things hooked and landed. Um, once you get that hook popped out, and sometimes it takes some work to get that thing out. Yeah. Like, you stick them, you own them, and it, sometimes it's kind of a battle getting the hook out of them. Yeah. You literally, on a trocar point of any size or any wire gauge, you can run it across the back of your hand. If it cuts you, then you're good. Because it will. <laughs> but don't cut yourself with it. <laughs> It'll cut you open. It and will. If it, if it doesn't, then it's probably dull. And again, those ones are kind of hard to resharpen yeah. just because there's three different working cutting edges on those things. Yeah. And you know what's funny? When we are trimming the jigs, the trocars don't actually scare me because I know they're not, they're going to slice me, right? When, I, when I'm trimming them, hand trim, and that sounds horrible, but it's going to cut me. It is the ones, the, the needle points that actually scare me because they're going to stick me, you know, and, and not that the trocars don't, but I found when I'm trimming them, they only cut me. I don't bury them into my hand where a needle point, you even got one through your fingernail that one time through your thumb. So it, it definitely happens. They, we fully believe in sharp hooks and we, uh, we've caught ourselves with them a few times. <laughs> So that, I think, wraps it up. We've only been talking forever. We warned you guys this was a big topic. This is really, really important to us, and we think this is the biggest topic when picking your fishing lures is what is the hook? Is it good? Is it? Can it withstand pressure? Can it, you know, there are so many things to consider when picking a fishing jig, and hook is the biggest and and again with our our assortment of stuff we designed it behind the fishermen in mind we want it to work for you and be the the easiest hook you can use to properly hook and land fish yeah and that hook makes so, all the difference in the world yeah you can absolutely have the magic rod and reel on the magic spot with the perfect setup, the perfect jig, everything goes right and that fish bites. And if you got the wrong hook, you're in trouble. Yeah. You're probably not going to land that fish. And we learned that the hard way over and over. And that is why our products were born because we got tired of that being the way it was going. Yeah. Especially for tube jigs. I mean, that's our big, yeah. that's our big push. We, the heavy wire tube was our, our first thing that yeah. we made. And it has the, the biggest following out of all of our stuff. And especially these big lake trout guys. And you start looking around at all our posts over the last several years and all the tags that we've gotten. Those heads are helping people hook and land these fish at a much higher rate than anything on the market before. And what an honor, like, for us, that people try them and use them and love them in the end. it's We're very honored for everyone's support. But we've also worked really hard to make sure they work. That matters to us. We do not want to sell crappy products. That is never 
what we intend ever, ever, ever. We want quality products that we know are gonna stand up to the fish and the fishermen. Because let's, be, let's face it, fishermen are hard <laughs> on fishing lures. I am really hard <laughs> on fishing lures. And he's over here shaking his head yes, like, oh. She really is. <laughs> so that is what we wanted. And we want multi-use jigs. Stuff that you can use multiple seasons, different species. That was our goal in mind. So there's a lot of stuff for you to wrap your head around on hooks. <laughs> but hopefully... That gives you some like real world examples of, you know, things you can physically look at in a hook, in a package, on a shelf that can tell you um, what it's designed for. If you use it, how do you need to set the hook using that particular style hook? What can you expect as far as how it'll flex or not flex? The hook gap, why that matters, depending on the species that you're trying to catch. All those different things that go into play when you're selecting a jig head or a hook. We know this podcast was a little longer than normal. Thank you for everyone who stuck it out. Save it. If you're on Facebook, watch it multiple times. We share it on YouTube. It's on our website. Thank you all for tuning in to the Level Up Fishing Podcast. We'll see you on the water.